Hello there. Today, for our devotional, we're going to be looking at the life of Mary. And that song, when I was growing up, I think I would hear that on a movie or something, and it's background music, and it just stuck in my head, and I recently learned to play that on guitar, and I really enjoy that. I'm still still learning it, but um, it's such a beautiful, peaceful um, piece, of, piece of art, Ave Maria. Um, we're going to talk about Mary's example of faith today. I uh, read a story this week about a police officer pulling over a guy for speeding, and the following exchange took place. The officer said, may I see your driver's license? The driver said, mm, I don't have one. Uh, it, I had it suspended when I got my third DUI. The officer said, well, may I see the owner's card for this vehicle? And the driver said, it's not my car. I stole it. The car is stolen? The driver said, yeah, that's right. But come to think of it, I think I saw the owner's card in the glove box where I, when I put my gun in there. There's a gun in the glove box, the officer said. Yep, uh, that's where I put it after I shot and killed the woman who owns this car and stuffed her in the trunk. The officer said, there's a body in the trunk? Yeah, you heard me. Hearing this, the officer immediately called his captain. The car was quickly surrounded by police, and the captain approached the driver and, uh, to handle the tense situation. The captain said, sir, can I see your license? The driver said, sure, here it is. It was valid. The captain said, well, whose car is this? The driver said, it's mine, officer. Sir, here's the registration. The captain said, could you slowly open your glove box so that I can see if there's a gun in it? The driver said, yes, sir, but there's no gun in it. Sure enough, there was no gun in the glove box. The captain said, would you mind opening your trunk? I was told that there was a body in there. The driver said, no problem. Pop the trunk open. It opened. No body. I don't understand, the captain said. The officer who stopped you said that you told him you didn't have a license, you had stolen the car, there was a gun in the glove box, and a dead body in the trunk. The driver said, yeah, I bet you he said I was speeding too. What? I mean, that guy... That guy, that guy had quite a, quite a plan, didn't he, to get out of a speeding ticket, if that's what all of that was. Mind games, perhaps? The captain? I'm sure he, in a scenario like this, would have thought he was going crazy. Perhaps the police officer. Maybe he thought the police officer was going crazy. You know, <clears throat> when we go back and look at the story of Mary, um, there's a decent chance that maybe Mary thought she was going crazy there for, for a while. I mean... No one in Israel had heard from a prophet officially for 400 years. The prophet Malachi was the last Old Testament writing prophet. And although there were other teachers and perhaps those that would qualify as prophets, no one had heard direct revelation from God and recorded it as scripture. Scholars refer to these years between the end of the Old Testament era and the time of Christ as the silent years. Now think about that amount of time, 400 years. That's a long time. That's a long time if you think of it in terms of American history. In fact, America is not nearly 400 years old. I mean, there were, there were European settlers here. The Spanish had this area. The French were here. The British were elsewhere. But if you go back in time 400 years, there was no America. Jamestown was just establishing and fortifying itself. Galileo had just invented the telescope. The King James Bible was fresh off the press. There were no Baptists or Methodists. The Presbyterian Church was really still in its infancy and being established. I mean, they were just getting established. So much can happen in 400 years. From the young teenage Mary's perspective, 400 years must have seemed even longer. After Malachi, the Old Testament prophet, had the last words 400 years before the Jews, I mean, they eagerly awaited the Messiah, but I mean, a lot of history took place in there. To a young Mary, it must have seemed like the longest time. Now, don't get me wrong, Mary had a very strong faith, and that's why, that's why the Lord chose Mary. 
Um, there must have been, though. In fact, we know, the Bible tells us, that there was a degree of shock when the angel Gabriel showed up. I mean, I mean first of all, place yourself in her shoes. If an angel showed up to you, and you knew it was an angel, already that would be a lot to wrap your mind around. Now, I don't know if Gabriel appeared just in human form, or if there was a certain aura or glow, or something about this angel that Mary knew, but, but Mary knew. She knew. She was in shock, but she knew. And, the Gabriel, and Gabriel announced to her that she would be giving birth to the Messiah, the Christ child, that she would still be a virgin. She, she, Mary's normal question was, how could this be? I, I don't know a man. I've never known a man in that way. And Gabriel said that the Holy Spirit would come upon her and put the Christ child in her. Let's actually read the text from Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. The Bible says, during Elizabeth's sixth month of pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin. She was engaged to marry a man named Joseph from the family of David. Her name was Mary. The angel came to her and said, Greetings. The Lord has blessed you and is with you. But Mary was very startled by what the angel said and wondered what this greeting might mean. The angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. God has shown you his grace. Listen, you will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of King David, his ancestor. He will rule over the people of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. Mary said to the angel, How will this happen since I'm a virgin? And the angel said to Mary, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will cover you. For this reason, the baby will be holy, and will be called the Son of God. Now Elizabeth, your relative, is also pregnant with a son, though she is very old. Everyone thought she could not have a baby, but she has been pregnant for six months. God can do anything. Mary said, I am the servant of the Lord. Let this happen to me as you say. Then the angel went away. This may very well have been the greatest privilege and honor any human being has ever been entrusted with. And it happened to a young, young Jewish girl. A young girl that, yes, was betrothed to be married, which most likely meant she was a teenager, probably a young teenager. In those days, women were married very young. As soon as they were able to bear children, they became eligible for marriage. And Joseph was probably a bit older. Joseph and Mary's mother would have already uh, participated in the traditional betrothal agreement, which would have involved Joseph having given a dowry to Mary's father on earth, and uh, everything was worked out, but Mary's pregnant now. And we know the story. If, if, if you need a quick reminder, Joseph was a little upset by this. Yeah, Mary came to him, and she he obviously loved Mary, but she came to him and said, to, to her future husband, I'm pregnant. And the Lord is the one that did it. Now, again, talk about shock and I'm not believing this. I mean, he wanted to believe it. And the Bible said he was going to put her away privately, meaning a bill of divorcement was in order. You see, back then, uh, when someone was betrothed, it was different than our engagement. It's similar. It's parallel to our engagement, except that it was legally binding. I mean, if I get engaged, which uh, hopefully won't happen again in this lifetime for me because I have a wife of 20 plus years and I love her and that's that's it for me, I hope. I hope that, that we both live a long, long time. And, and um, But if, if, uh, if I were to get engaged and give a ring to someone and ask someone to marry me and she decided to break it off, she could just hand the ring back to me. Technically, she wouldn't even have to hand the ring back to me. Or I could just ask for the ring back. Or I could just verbally tell her, we're breaking up. 
But back then, it was a bill of divorcement that was in order. And something like premarital relations was very serious. Um, back in this time when um, if, a, if a man found out that his wife-to-be or wife was not a virgin, he could have her put to death. And at the very least, um, she would live a life of shame and scorn among uh, others around her. Imagine the shame and the concern this would have brought to her family. God chose Mary. He entrusted her with this tremendous task. And knowing that there would be questions, knowing that there would be people who wouldn't believe them. But God in his grace actually did send the angel to Joseph as well, so that Joseph could get firsthand from the Lord, from the Lord's messenger, that, um, no, your, your, your bride has not cheated on you. She's carrying the Christ child. Wow. Wow. Even though he was probably relieved, this was not nearly as disappointing, but even more shocking. He was most likely so relieved that Mary had been faithful, but again, worried with a new concern. But this message is more about Mary. What an internal conflict she must have felt. Great and awesome privilege, yet concern for her and her family and their reputation, and concern for her husband's reputation, knowing that even though Joseph received the angelic visitor, who's going to believe that? Who would believe that? The Bible says Mary was startled, but at the end of the discussion with Gabriel, she said, I am the Lord's servant. Let this happen to me, as you say. Mary knew when she said those words, she was being submissive. She was yielding to God's plan for her life. And, and yes, although this was a privilege beyond all privileges, it must have felt, she must have felt this tremendous weight as well. This tremendous sense of responsibility that someone her age, that no one in history had ever been asked to do, but someone her age would have been overwhelmed by. Now, I just want to ask you this morning and challenge you with this question. Can you follow Mary's example? Can you admire her simple yet courageous faith? Can you agree with Mary that you are the Lord's servant? and willingly submit to his will for your life, regardless of the consequences? That's a question I've asked myself this week. It's a question I've asked myself before. It's not easy sometimes. When I lost my mother and when I lost my daughter in both of those situations, especially the second one, this question ran through my mind a lot. I mean, sometimes circumstances happen and whether we submit to God's will or not, it just happens. But I did, and I'm thankful that I did. And by God's grace, I was able to have that perspective. But at the same time, I realized that that I could have just as easily gone the other way with that. And maybe, maybe you've been in a situation where you were asked to do something that you felt like was impossible to let someone go to deal with some circumstance that was overwhelming, and maybe you didn't submit. But let me tell you that the reason God the Father sent his Son into this world was to forgive us of those sins, sins of rebellion, sins of, of disbelief, sins of every category and every specific sin. So I want to encourage you from this day forward to follow Mary's example. We can admire her simple and courageous faith, we can agree with her that we are the Lord's servants. I mean, he created us. We are his. We belong to him, whether we acknowledge it or not. The Bible says one day that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I just want to encourage you to do that sooner than later. 
Would you be willing to do that and regardless of what it means to your reputation? It's no secret that in this world to follow Christ sometimes means to be made fun of. And in today's political climate, sometimes I think Christians deserve to be made fun of. I can't believe what I see on the news sometimes. I can't believe what I see on social media. I'm trying to avoid social media. I've been I've been connecting with these hiking groups and and places I like to visit and artists artists like Van Gogh that I that I admire and I'm getting a lot of that on my feed now and that's much more comforting than reading people's opinions about about politics and other things going on in our world because there's just so much confusion and so much frustration and and I'm afraid a lot of Christians are going down the wrong path and um, looking to human leaders as their saviors. You see, Mary didn't do that. There were leaders in her community that were going to look down on her. But she said, I am the Lord's servant. Let this happen to me as you say. If we take a stand truly for what's right, truly for the gospel, people aren't going to understand. If we stand for justice, if we take up for those that are hurting, for the poor, for the for the ones on the margin of society that everybody else seems to not have time for, if we stand for those people, we may get laughed at. We may be looked down upon by some of the movers and shakers of our society. But who is it that we want to please? Can we be like Mary and say, I am the Lord's servant. Let this happen to me as you say. Can we say that regardless of what it might mean to our financial situation? Our livelihood? Our friends, even our family? Sometimes they're members of our family that won't understand us for standing up for what's right. Are we willing to step out of our comfort zone and say with Mary, I am the Lord's servant? Let happen to me whatever you say, Lord. Remember that God loves you unconditionally and will only ask of you that which is ultimately best for you and his kingdom. We will not always see that which is best. We may never see it on this side of eternity. But if it were all perfectly clear to us, there'd be very little room for faith. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. So, we're going to live this life by faith if we take that stand. God knows we live in a sin-cursed world. He knows all about your trials and your difficulties. He knows all of this. He sent his son, the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus, into this world to live among us, to become like us in every way except sin. He not only provided an example of how to live and how to die, but showed us that through him we can have abundant life now and eternal life in the hereafter. I want to close with a verse that's been going through my mind recently the last few weeks. It's in 1 Peter chapter 5. It's actually two verses, 6 and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. I'm going to read that one more time. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. I'd rather not be under any other hand than his mighty hand. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. No matter what you're going through, can you, like Mary, say with all sincerity, I am the Lord's servant. Let this happen to me as you say. Fathers, we wrap this little devotional up. I thank you for the example of Mary. And although we tend to focus a little more on Jesus this time of the year, as we should all year round, we pause to consider Mother Mary, the earthly, the woman, the teenager that you chose for this amazing and tremendous task. I thank you for her example of faith. Help us to be a little bit more like her. Help us to be willing 
to put you first, to acknowledge that we are your servants, and to be willing to let you use us in whatever way you see fit. We pray in Christ's name.